I'd like to focus more particularly on the Prophet. And even in the case of the Prophet, more specifically on two questions or objections raised that he could not qualify as a Prophet because of them. The first, the way he treated non-Muslims, especially allegation that he persecuted, quote unquote, or massacred Jews in Medina because they rejected him as a prophet. And secondly, the question of his marriages. Let me begin first with his treatment of non-Muslims. And here again, we distinguish between two periods, just for the sake of ease and chronology. The Meccan period, the first 13 years of his mission, when Muslims were persecuted, and the Medinan period, the remaining 10 years of his mission. In Mecca, <laughs> we find that uh, the, his encounter included encounters with at least two groups. One is the idolatrous Arabs, the other is with Christians. As far as the encounter with idolatrous Arabs, we find that it is subdivided also into two types, positive and negative. By, that, by positive, we mean his encounter with those who rejected Islam but did not seek to hurt or undermine Islam or the Prophet and how he dealt with them. The best example for this is his uncle, Abu Talib. <coughs> Abu Talib did not accept Islam until his death. But he did not put obstacles before the Prophet. He even defended the Prophet and his right to preach what he believed in or claimed to have received as revelation. For that type of relationship, the Prophet, peace be upon him, Prophet Muhammad, more than reciprocated that courtesy. He loved his uncle in spite of his idolatrous beliefs so dearly. He respected him and he treated him with all kindness that is owed to a peaceful non-Muslim. But we have also the encounter in Mecca with those who showed aggressiveness and hurt the Prophet and Muslims and tortured them. There are many examples. Let me give you two. The first is one of his other uncles, Abu Jahl. In fact, it was reported that one time Abu Jahl passed by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he started abusing him verbally in a very, very ugly way. Then there was a young lady who was overhearing this kind of conversation or discussion. She kept watching what's happening. After Abu Jahl has his vile words against the Prophet, the Prophet simply looked at him but did not respond. A few minutes later, another uncle of the Prophet, Hamza, was coming from his hunting trips. And Hamza also, like Abu Jahl, did not believe or did not accept Islam and follow the Prophet. Then he passed by that young lady and she tells him, Hamza, do you realize what happened to your nephew, Muhammad? He said, what? He said, Abu Jahl abused him so badly. He said, what did Muhammad وسلم, do or say? He said he didn't reciprocate with evil words. He just left him, he just left, moved away from him. It was that nobility of the Prophet in the face of abuse, which is one of his characteristics, that softened the heart of Hamza. And that was actually the turning point in his life. Hamza, he was a very husky, strong, and aggressive person by nature, actually. He walked right to the Kaaba, where Abu Jahl was sitting with the chieftains of Quraysh. And he hit him 
with his bow on his head caused him an injury and he said you abuse Muhammad I say what he says and I follow his religion you can see the magic of kindness vis-a-vis -vis, uh, responding to evil with evil the second example is amazing in itself how to deal even with those who are aggressors at least one form of dealing there are various ways and that was when Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him being persecuted and rejected in Mecca sought to find some followers and a base a secure base to preach the word of God as he received it and believed in it so he goes to a nearby township known as a Taif he goes there to talk to people invite them to monotheism and so on and then he's mocked first by adults I'll give you an example of mockery one of the people in a Taif tells him huh you're telling me that you're a prophet it is either you are a liar or truthful and if you're a liar I don't want to listen to a liar and if you're truthful and you're indeed a prophet oh you're too big for me to sit and listen to you can't win but then it didn't stop at that they send their children and instigate them against the prophet they start pelting him with stones he start bleeding blood goes into his sandals and then he take refuge in a wall of a garden that belongs to a couple of Christians brothers and he sits there making his earnest prayer to Allah that if you are not angry with me oh Allah I don't care meaning I don't care for this suffering in the middle of all of that pain physical and psychological he says the angel of God came to him and he said for those arrogant people if it's okay with you God has permitted me we could simply crush them between these two mountains most humans perhaps would be thinking of vengeance it's part of human nature that needs to be controlled and the Prophet showed us how to control and the Prophet answered the angel and he tells him no because I hope to Allah that out of these people's descendants their children there will be people who will worship him and that was very prophetic this is exactly what happened later and then he made a very noble statement the same statement that is attributed to another noble prophet who immediately came before Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him but about six centuries before Prophet Jesus peace be upon him which shows that what these prophets were teaching is coming from the same light not they're copying from one another they're all receiving from the same source of inspiration from God he said oh God oh Allah forgive my people for they know not what they're doing forgive my people for they know not what they're doing the second encounter with Christians in this early days even when the persecution of Muslim for their faith including people who were martyred because of their faith became very hard and difficult to bear you know what the Prophet tells his followers before even the major migration to Medina he tells them you go to Abyssinia migrate there and then he started to praise a Christian he said there is a king there a Christian king in whose realm people are not wronged so he's praising him not necessarily for his belief because he doesn't share this belief for example in Trinity and so on but he's praising one human quality in that Abyssinian Christian king that is fair and just praising him now one observation 
That good relationship and courtesy continued not only when Muslims were persecuted. When Muslims even became powerful and had their own state and base in Medina later, we never hear about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, ordering, for example, the invasion of Abyssinia. And that fly in the face of mistaken interpretation that some even Muslim may have, that it is the duty of Muslims to fight all people in the world until they accept Islam or at least come under the rule of Islam. If this were true, the first implementer of that would have been the Prophet himself. There is no record whatsoever. And that shows, as I'll be showing later, that when Islam allowed fighting either for self-defense or against oppression, it was not meant to include people who are not Muslims but coexisting peacefully with Muslims. This is a clear lesson that we know from the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now we go to his encounters in Medina, when Muslims already migrated and he migrated with them to Medina. Here we find multiple encounters with non-Muslims, with the Jews, with Christians, and with idolatrous Arabs as a whole. Let's see how he dealt with each of these situations and what kind of developments took place with Jews. <coughs> One of the first three major acts of the Prophet, peace be upon him, upon moving to Medina, beside the body system, the brotherhood between the migrants and settlers, and also the building of the mosque as a center, not only for prayers, for everything, for Muslims. But the third act was known as as sahifa which can be described as Dr. Muhammad Hamidullah, may Allah bless his soul, call it perhaps the first multicultural, multi-religious, pluralistic constitution in the world that guaranteed equal rights for everybody irrespective of their faith. Because in that sahifa or constitution that everybody was a signatory to, it was agreed that Muslims, irrespective of their tribes, irrespective whether they are migrants or settlers in Medina, are to be regarded as one community united by faith. The same equal treatment were given to the various Jewish tribes. There were various tribes also. That all Jews in Medina, irrespective of their tribes, are to be regarded also as one community of faith united by their Judaism. Secondly, the Sahifa or constitution guaranteed full rights and autonomy and freedom of worship and belief to everyone, Jews and Muslims and everyone else for that matter. Number three, it was agreed also that Jews and Muslims should be co-defenders of Medina. Should any enemy attack Medina, both are obligated as two communities to stand together against any aggression and never to help any enemy attacking Medina. Fourthly, that no side should give refuge to someone who committed a crime. You don't take refuge in one community. Neither can give refuge. Okay? That was an amazing liberal kind of treatment and approach and reaching out to what the Quran called people of the book applying to Jews and Christians, especially people of the book, because of this, there's a great deal of affinity in their relationship with Muslims, both the three normally called Abrahamic religion, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, share the belief in the one God they might see or believe in God in different ways, but they all believe in the oneness of God. Revelation, scripture, prophets, responsibility for our deeds, moral code for life. Lots, there are differences, but there are lots of common themes also that unite these people. And may, may I add also one more point that should be added. That all parties, including the Jewish tribes in Medina, all agreed that the head of the whole community would be the prophet. So you have autonomy and the religious practice and everything, but to have any organized society or a state, 
the head was accepted by all to be Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, <clears throat> what happened later, unfortunately, is that especially three tribes, one tribe after the other, broke this agreement of peaceful coexistence and mutual respect and engaged in hostilities towards Muslims in some degree or the other. The Prophet in his position and responsibility as the enforcer of the law, the constitution of Medina, to which everybody signed, he had the responsibility to apply fair punishment and proportionate punishment to whoever committed an offending act. However, there are a number of observations about the approach and the fairness of the Prophet in dealing with the offending people. Number one, it is impossible to think of any punitive action against those who broke the law as anti-Semitism. It is silly to say anti-Semitism because Prophet Muhammad himself is a pure Semite. He's a descendant of Ishmael. Arabs, true Arabs, original Arabs, are more pure Semites than some Jews who converted to Judaism later on who came from even non-Semite origins. So it's almost like saying anti-Semite, Semite. There's no reason. Secondly, it is impossible to think that this punitive action against offenses was anti-Jewishness. And why anti-Jewishness if the Quran mentioned the name of Prophet Moses a lot more than the name of Prophet Muhammad himself? And the Quran describes the original Torah, Torah, giving to Moses as one that contains light and guidance. The recognition is there. It could not be anti-Jewishness. Thirdly, it is impossible to think of these punishments as punishment for people because they rejected him as a prophet. He was hoping they would follow him, but they rejected him. Why? Because the prophet and Muslims are prohibited by the text of the Quran in many verses one is the chapter 2, verse 256, let there be no compulsion in religion. The freedom of conscience and worship is guaranteed in several places in the Quran. With this background of what is not, let's see what was in terms of proper approach to enforcement of the law. Number one, the prophet never stereotyped and lump all the Jews together when it comes to punishment. They were together in terms of their rights, their unity and religion, that's fine. But they were never together when punishment was inflicted. Only the offending tribe was punished, not the others. This is significant, because if you're anti group of people, you tend to lump them like the kind of treatment Muslims are being subjected to, especially in North America. You lump everybody together. No only the tribe that committed the offense. Secondly, the punishment for the offense was always, always proportionate to the offense that was committed. For example, without getting into great details, in the case of Banu Qaynuqa, it was a major offense, but in the case of Banu Nadir, the next incident, the offense was much greater, including conspiracy to kill the Prophet. And in the case of Banu Quraiza, it was what we call today in modern legal language, high treason at the time of war. We said earlier, and that's what we'd like to focus a little bit more on because they were, of course, fatalities in this kind of punishment. We mentioned earlier that one of the clauses of the constitution of Medina is that both Jews and Muslims defend Medina against invaders or attackers, that none should cooperate with the enemy against their fellow Medinaites people living in Medina and its surrounding. And then we know historically, and you read the most authentic reference on that, the seerah of Ibn Ishaq, that the Arabs, when they lost hope of really 
trying to destroy the Prophet, they tried to gather a huge army, a coalition of various tribes, not limited anymore to the Meccan people, a huge army, 10,000 strong. They surrounded Medina with the view of trying to wipe out the Muslims. Now Muslims and Jews were live, living side by side in Medina. Yet, information were relayed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that there have been contacts between the invading army and the chief and of the tribe of Banu Quraiza in, in order to get rid of Muhammad as a problem for them and for them also, for, for the pagan Arabs as well as for the Jews. In fairness, Ibn Ishaq says that in the beginning when that offer was made uh, or encouragement to the chief of the tribe of Banu Quraiza, he hesitated. And look at his words and acknowledgement. He says, ما علمنا من محمد إلا وفاء. When another fellow Jew who was also ahead of another tribe tried to say, that's your chance. Muhammad and Muslim do not chance, do not stand any chance. They will be finished. So you better join. In the beginning he said, no, we have never seen from Muhammad except faithfulness, meaning respect of his agreement. So he did hesitate. But apparently he was tempted and he, you know, in these tribes, when they make a decision, it's not the decision of the chief. They were quite democratic. It's at least people of fighting age, the adults would meet and discuss a very important issue like that. And it appears that the consensus finally that yes, Muhammad never betrayed his treaty, but he doesn't stand a chance. So let's join hands. The prophet wanted to make sure not to jump to conclusions. So he sent an emissary to talk to the leaders of that tribe to see whether this information is correct or not, not just to jump the gun on the basis of claims of imminent dangers as you hear today in recent times. He wanted to make absolutely sure. And he goes and talks that emissary. And he tell him, is it true, the treaty that we have? And he said, what treaty? What treaty? They come back and relay the information that it is true, it is coming through the horse's mouth. The treaty is no longer respected or acknowledged by that tribe. But then they say it was the prophet who ordered the execution of the fighting men. In fact, this is a great falsification of history. And in fact, if the prophet even did that, it would have been perfectly his authority. He's been accepted by all, part, all parties as the head of the state. And here you have a case of high treason at the time of war when everybody was in danger, Muslims in particular, and you get a stab in the back from within. What would any state do, any head of a state do in a case like, it would have been his authority even if he ordered the capital punishment for those responsible for that betrayal. But in fact, he didn't even use that authority. Was, when he was besieged by the head of hypocrites, Ibn Salul, he suggested that the, that tribe, the offending tribe, chooses its own arbitrator. Its own arbitrator. And whatever decision he comes up with, it is binding. Well, I happen, like Brother Shamshad said, that I teach not only Islamic studies, I teach also management, more particularly industrial relations. And I know, like many of you also in the legal profession, that when you talk about arbitration as opposed to conciliation or mediation, Arbitration means that you choose someone who is mutually accepted by both parties. Yet the Prophet was so generous and so lenient that he says, you choose your own arbitrator. And they did. And you know how they chose? They chose a man by the name of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. And why they chose him? Because he was their ally before Islam came to Medina. He was very close to them. And he was familiar with their Torah and their system, even though he was not a Jew himself. They, they chose him. And Sa'd ibn Mu'adh stands there and addresses both the Prophet and Muslims as well as the Jews, the, the, this particular tribe, Banu Quraiza. And he's basically trying to get approval from them that if I come up with a decision, would everybody abide by it? And by the way, he, he need not ask that question. Again, anyone in industrial relation or law, you know that arbitration is final and binding. There could be no challenge for the arbitrator's decision, even in modern legal 
systems unless there is a proof of bribery or violation of basic rules of common law, like refusing to hear evidence and so on. But otherwise, you don't say the arbitrator granted us 5% increase in pay, uh, but uh, we don't agree, so we're not going to implement it. No, once you agree to arbitration, you know that the decision is final and binding. This is very ac clear and acceptable principle. And Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad stand there and says to the, uh, the tribe of Banu Quraiza, I'm going to rule on you in accordance of your own Torah, in accordance with your own Torah, which provide, of course, for capital punishment, at least for fighting men. The women and children were spared. Yet they keep saying the Prophet massacred. It is true that the Prophet agreed with his uh, judgment, but he didn't have a choice to agree. It was an arbitration decision that everybody agreed to accept. So I hope that this clarifies some of those distortions that sometimes we hear in the media or some other writings. A second encounter with Christians. Here again we find the positive and negative. Even in the case of Jews, they have been the positive and negative. They were good relationship at one point until they started breaking the agreement. So every situation was dealt with accordingly. With Christians, also there was the positive and negative. Example of the positive, when the Christians of Najran, the, the region of Najran, which is now in Yemen, sent their emissaries to find out about Islam and talk to the Prophet, peace be upon him. He was so courteous with them. He received them cheerfully. And you know where he took them? He hosted them in his own mosque. In his own mosque. And he let them speak freely about their beliefs. He answered their question and so on. Some narrators say that at one point in this discussion, the Christian group said, can we be excused to go out? He says, why is that? He said, we want to do our prayers. He said, you're welcome to do it here. Imagine the hospitality that he showed to, the, to his guests. In fact, we know historically that there have been instances where some of those Christian groups, there were several who came to see him, actually accepted Islam. And the Quran seemed to refer to that because when they accepted Islam, they were rebuked by the Meccan uh, idolatrous people and the Quran report them as saying peace be with you you know for us our deeds to you your deeds we seek no argument with those who are ignorant the Quran actually make reference so they were cases of very positive interaction aside from what happened of course in, in Mecca in terms of their relationship with Abyssinia but then there was also the negative and it has to be dealt with there were cases when the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him sent memorizers of the Quran in order to teach the Quran to certain tribes, they were killed. There were cases of a Christian king, Assassinites, you know, Assassinites were the uh, uh, tribe of Arabs in the northern part of Arabia because of their proximity to Byzantium, they became Christian. And one of their kings, the Prophet sent an emissary to him, he kills him. And there was another case. And we know, of course, in international law today, to deliberately kill an ambassador of another country is an act of what? It's an act of war. It's not just against one particular person. But it went beyond that to gathering, to the gathering of a huge army, a huge army from the Byzantine Empire, of course, who could not, whose rulers and emperors could not stand the religion that says everybody's free in the sight of God. All of us are slaves of God. God is the only master calling for equality. Like some of them used to say, even this religion is going to turn our slaves against us. And the Prophet did march, actually, to the place which is called Tabuk. Tabuk now is a city in the northern part of Saudi Arabia. But fortunately, the, uh, the Byzantine army dispersed and there was no battle. So there were cases also where battle took place. And later on, when aggression again was repeated or was prepared for, it was aborted also by action against aggression. And there is no bones about it. The Quran is quite clear that you have only two reasons to go to the battlefield. And some of you might have heard the, um, the BBC Asia radio. There was an interview with Sheikh Abdullah Hakim and myself. It was made clear there that um, so long as people are living and coexisting in peace, you have no right to fight against them. The two reasons for fighting in the battlefield or jihad, the combative type of jihad, which is one of many, is either aggression or oppression. 
the Quran is quite clear. In chapter 2, verses 190 through 194, it begins by saying, fight in the way of God those who fight against you but commit no excesses or aggression for God doesn't love the aggressor or those who commit excess. It can be translated both ways. Second reason is found a couple of verses after. Fight until there is no more oppression and religion belongs to God. That means there will be freedom of religion for Muslims and others as well. These are the only reasons. And when there were cases and there were cases of oppression and aggression that justified again fighting against them to protect peace and to protect freedom as well. The third encounter, we talked about Jews, Christians, encounter with Arabs. You know the tribal society in Arabia, one has to understand that it was a very violent world in which Islam was born. If you read the book by Karen Armstrong about the life of the Prophet, she had an in a very interesting statement in which she said, she says that Islam was born in a very violent world. You know, all this rivalry between the Byzantian and the Persian and all of this. And you didn't have Kofi Annan or United Nations if they were good enough for stopping conflict even. There was nothing like that. So to survive, you've got to deal with the situation as it arises. But the Prophet tried again to avoid bloodshed. How did he do that? He used to send expeditions to the tribes surrounding Medina. Why? Because there is a great fear that they might come under pressure and intimidation even from the dominant Meccan tribe of Quraysh to join forces with them against Muslims. In some cases, some of those people said, look, Muhammad, peace be upon him, we give you our word. We're not going to fight against you. We're not going to help anyone fighting against you. In other words, a mutual, you know, peaceful relationship with you. The Prophet never said, no, but you have to come under our control or rule. And this is known actually as a term, technical term, muada'a. You say, sara ilayhim wa wada'u. Muada'a means having a peaceful agreement, leave them alone, but will not touch you. The motto of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his reach out to these tribes is very interesting as you compare it with Mr. Bush's statement. He said, basically, I mean, his approach can be summed up. If you're not with us, don't hurt us. Not an arrogant, tyrannical, undemocratic statement. If you're not with us, you're with the enemy. That's undemocratic. It doesn't give me a chance to say I am against the enemy and against your rash policy and deception. Can't you take that position? No, no, you're not entitled with us or with the enemy and the enemy are terrorists, so you're a terrorist, and terrorists can be killed anywhere. If you're not with us, don't hurt us. See the fairness. And we're talking 1,400 years before the civilized uh, time that we are living in today. But then there were aggression also. In the case of Arabs like Jews and Christians, this was the positive. There was the negative also, and it has to be dealt with for Muslim to survive, or else Islam would have been, as the Arabs say, kana, would have disappeared totally from the face of the earth. An assault after assault was made against Muslims by the Meccan Arabs and their allies. The Prophet was giving the permission for the first time, not in Mecca, in Medina, and later in Medina, to fight, to fight back, to preserve their existence, and defend their survival, which is a basic human right for anyone. No wonder, as the commentators of the Quran indicate, that the first verse that was revealed in the Quran that ever gave permission for Muslims to fight back is in Surah Al-Hajj, that chapter 22 in the Quran, which says permission has been given to the believers, those who have been oppressed, that indeed wrong has been done to them, that Allah is able to give them victory. The first ever that give permission. And by the way, some interesting remark. One time I was discussing with a Christian friend of mine, and he said, look, your prophet engaged in a battlefield. Yet, Prophet Jesus 
or Jesus never lifted a finger even and maintained his peace throughout his mission. I asked him, how long was the mission of Jesus? He said, most scholars say, three years. He said, indeed, we love Jesus, we believe in him, and he should get credit for withholding his hands and asking his followers to withhold their hands for a complete three years under persecution. But don't you also give credit to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he withheld his hand for 13 years, not three years, 13 years in Mecca before even permission came to fight back in Medina. And the situation was different from the time of Jesus to the time of Prophet Muhammad. Again, we cannot compare the two situations historically and put them in the same uh, bag. Here I'd like to indicate one thing. A particular incident that was very important in terms of the shaping of the Muslim etiquette in the battlefield that unfortunately many, including some Muslims, no apology, the Quran says you have to say the truth even if it's against yourself or your close kins. Many Muslims even have grossly misinterpreted that reference in the Quran. How many times have you heard in polemical literature and assaults on Islam and all, in all media that the Quran teaches hatred and violence, it sanctions it, it even commands its followers because they say the Quran say, go and kill the unbeliever wherever you find them. Is there anyone here who hasn't heard that yet? I'm sure you've heard it. Islam say, go and kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. First of all, first mistake or distortion. It doesn't say unbelievers. Those who know Arabic, it says al-mushrikeen. And mushrikeen is a term that has never been applied as a title for the people of the book. It has been used in this context to refer to idolatrous Arabs. Mistake two. It, the verse in chapter 9, verse 5, is taken totally out of context, historical and textual. How historical? I'll give you the background. After the Muslims migrated to Medina, in about the sixth year after migration to Medina, Muslims wanted to go back for pilgrimage. And that might have been also intended as a peaceful gesture towards the Meccans, that they're coming for worship, not for fight. Every sign and every precaution was made that they appear to be coming only for pilgrimage. They're not coming with arms and, you know, all the shields and so on. They were stopped, intercepted and stopped at the outskirts of Mecca. Muslims were irritated that they preventing them from reaching the house of their father Abraham, the Kaaba, and were ready to fight. And the Prophet, and that was his characteristic, by the way, whenever it was possible to have a just peace, he never opted for battlefield. He said, no, by God, if they negotiate anything with me, that maintains the peace and keep the kinship relationship, I will respond positively to that. The pagan Arabs came with great arrogance. A negotiation took place and they showed a great deal of arrogance and unfairness, yet the Prophet accepted. But some of the important provisions in this treaty is that there will be peace for 10 years, no fighting between either side. And that indeed was the major thing that that prophet was looking after, was looking at. There were other concessions Muslim gave that sounded unfair to them. But the main thing the prophet was interested in is to remove the barrier of communication between human beings. And indeed, it is very interesting to note that within nearly a year and a half, a year and a half of peaceful relationship where people can communicate without this hatred and stereotypes, more people entered into the fold of Islam than those who entered in the previous 19 years of conflict. More people in that year and a half than 19 years. And historically speaking, Islam spread much faster during the period of peace, not conflict and hatred. Right until this moment, when Muslims' situation is pathetic in every respect, 
Islam continued to spread so long as there is communication between human beings. No wonder Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to say, please, خلوا بيني وبين الناس. Please let me communicate with people. When he was in Mecca, they tried to prevent people even from listening to him. The Quran quotes them, said, don't listen to this Quran and make noise to have the upper hand. They intercept the pilgrims who are coming because Arabs also used to do pilgrimage in, in spite of their paganistic ideas. They intercept them and warn them, don't talk to Muhammad. He's a magician. He's a dangerous man. And why? They didn't want people to listen to him. Now, when that took place, like I said, the Islam spread. But apparently, some elements did not like that at all. And all of a sudden, unexpectedly, the aggression come against Muslims and their allies. And some people are killed cold-bloodedly at night. Who broke the treaty? The other side, not the Prophet. The Prophet respected every iota of his agreement. Now these are murderers. And what is the punishment of cold-blooded murder on that scale? Execution. There's no question. I know people have differing feelings and views, but even states today differ as to whether the, the uh, execution as a punishment is inhuman or not. There are countries that accept that as well. Now, it is in the context of this event that the Quran refers the, the event and what followed later on in instigation for another battle even after Mecca was opened that the Quran speaks about those who deserve to be killed because they are like war criminals. They are like war criminals. It is only those that the Quran speaks that in, in the battlefield you kill them wherever you find them because they deserve it. It is a just punishment for them. And to show that this is the correct way of understanding it, you go and read not only one part of an ayah, 9-5, the famous one, but read the entire section from verse 1 to 13 or 15. And you find the reason given. Number one, it excludes, even among the pagan Arabs, the Meccan people, it excludes exclude those who respected their treaty and never betrayed the Prophet. Number two, it gives the very reason why Muslims were allowed to fight them because they say, وَهُمْ بَدَأُوكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً They started, they were the ones who started aggression against you in the first place. Number three, the Quran itself says, لَا يَرْقُبُونَ فِي مُؤْمِنٍ إِلَّا وَلَا ذِمَّ They never observe any kinship, relationship, or even treaty that they have signed. So it is obvious, it is not a general statement about any non-Muslim. It is not a statement about all idolatrous Arabs. It is only against those criminals who committed the cold-blooded murder. Another or further proof is found in the Quran itself. The two verses that many scholars consider the constitution of the normal relationship between Muslims and peacefully coexisting non-Muslims. They appear in chapter 60, verses 8 and 9, that basically says any non-Muslim, Jew, Christian, you, know, you name it, pagan even, those who do not fight you because of your religion as Muslims or drive you out of your homes, take away your rights, your basic rights, and oppress you, you should deal with them in justice and birr. Birr is not just kindness because it is the same term used in the Quran and Hadith to designate the nature of one's relationship with his or her hmm? parents. And relationship with parents is not only justice and kindness, but love and respect. Even if you don't share certain beliefs, the basic love as, as a human being and respect are included. It is not by chance that God chose that particular term to designate how to relate to those who mean no ill to you and not oppressing you.